All right, let's get let's get in our, in our places here. Are we all set? Okay, good. What? <laughs> Is your youth commission giving you trouble? Okay, we're going to call this meeting to order and uh, start ourselves off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for Okay, roll call will show that all of council is in attendance. Um, can I get a motion on the approval of agenda and affidavit of posting? So moved second. Motion Bragman, second. <clears throat> Winesoff, all in favor say aye. Aye, aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that carries. Um, my announcement of closed session action, we had two items. Um, one is our public employment of town manager, and we are going to be delaying uh, for further deliberation to another closed session meeting that will be happening uh, next Wednesday. Uh, and we also had a conference with legal counsel on anticipated litigation, and we advised counsel on, on that issue. Uh, meeting protocol. The mayor shall maintain order at the meetings in accordance with Robert's rules of order, and the council has a responsibility to be a model of respectful behavior in order to encourage community participation and citizen input at the council meetings. The council and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motives of council members, staff, and or members of the public, and maintain standards of tolerance and civility. The town council will review the agenda at 10 p.m. to ascertain which items will be heard that evening and which, if any, will be continued to another meeting. Any matter not started by 11.30 p.m. will be continued to an adjourned or regular council meeting unless the council votes to suspend this rule. At this time, please turn off any cellular phones or put them in silent mode. We have a couple of announcements uh, tonight. The Fairfax Food Pantry, uh, Saturdays from 9 to 11 at the Fairfax Community Church at 2398 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. Uh, volunteers are needed, good for community service hours. One vacancy on the volunteer board with a full three-year term to November 30th, 2015. There's a vacancy on the Youth Commission for Ross Valley Youth between 14 and 19 years of age. There's a vacancy for a Youth Commissioner to serve on the Parks and Recs Commission for a two-year term. Uh, we will be having the Sustainable Fairfax uh, Craft Fair at the Fairfax Pavilion this Saturday from 11 to 4 p.m. Um, and there will also be holiday potluck wreath making and carol singing hosted by the Fairfax Volunteer Board on Sunday, December 16th from 2 to 5 p.m. And it's not on here, but there's also a, the Chamber of Commerce is doing a turn on the lights uh, at 5 p.m. in downtown. All the downtown businesses and the downtown tree lights will be turned on this Friday at 5 p.m. if you'd like to go watch them flip the switch. Um, our very first item uh, tonight is uh, the reorganization of our town council uh, with an election of a new mayor and vice mayor. Uh, the open time for a public comment will be after our presentations. Thank you, though. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Judy, do you want to give us instruction? Sure. This is the time. What are we supposed to do? This is a time when we reorganize the council, as we do once a year, and so we select a mayor and a vice mayor for the next coming year. So you can open it up to nominations, and we'll take it from there, I think. Do we open up to the public as well, or is it opening up no, to nominations just, for the council? That's what I thought. It's okay. just you guys. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have a nomination from the council for who should be our next mayor? Mayor? Yes. Um, I, would, I would nominate John Reed, our vice mayor. I also, uh, I think it may be something that just out of 
maybe, maybe we should open this up to the public just to see if there's any comments on how they feel we should do things before we go ahead and do this. I, sure. I don't see anything negative about doing that. I'm certainly fine with that. Uh, you, you have to take comments. Sure. If there's comment on on the action itself, I mean, how you can do that after you take a motion or okay. before it's up to you. All right, you. so we have a motion from uh, Councilmember Bragman, second from Councilmember Weinsoff. Um, let's take uh, an opportunity for to hear from the public on this matter, just this matter. <laughs> Lady Mayor, Lord Council Members, um, I'd like to present myself as the sacrificial next mayor so that you guys don't have to squabble about it, perhaps, and offer myself to be the next town mayor and possibly emperor of town. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much, Sierra. Are there but, but I would like to add one other thing, and that is um, if we can all get through the Christmas season and maybe like not buy a bunch of stuff we don't need and leave it like still growing in the ground somewhere else and have a good time and take care of each other because it's not about buying money. Or it's not about it's like, buying things that we don't need with money we don't have to give people stuff that they don't need. And enjoy. Thank you very much, Sierra. Is there any other public comment on this matter? Seeing none, I will close public comment. Um, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Seeing I'm none, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Do we switch chairs now or wait until after we do the vice mayor? Switch. Go. Tag team. Switch now. <laughs> that was easy. I'll trade you my coat for your coat. Don't worry about it. Oh, we'll it sorry. Out. Oh, okay. Here. So, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, All right. you should open nominations now for vice mayor. I'm sorry? You should open nominations now for vice mayor. Well, I'd mayor. like to. Or uh, however here. you want to do it, whatever um, order. Yeah, the, the uh, next order of business is uh, election of the new vice mayor. And that's yours, right? And uh, do I hear any nominations for that? I, I would nominate David Weinsoff. I would second that. Okay, well, we have a motion and a second. Is there any public comment? For this? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I'll take that to close the public comment on that. <laughs> uh, so, all those in favor of Aye. David Wentz? Aye. Aye. Okay. Got it. All right. Great. Um, all right. Well, I don't know if this is uh, on the agenda, but it's normal. Uh, I have here, surprisingly enough, a plaque presented to uh, one of the finest ma mayors that I've had the pleasure to work with, um, to uh, Pam Hartwell. And uh, the quote on it, it says, it's from Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the probability that we will fail in the struggle ought not to deter us from the support of a cause we believe to be just. So. cake now no uh, let me see so that was actually it was on the agenda presentation to the outgoing <laughs> outgoing mayor Hartwell um, and now we have I need some glasses here yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Good job. Yep. yeah I got my glass I have my stuff Are we so to break now or okay break, we now. break now yeah. you want to break now okay Why yeah better than going over actuarial reports. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, 
Great. Let's uh, take a break. There's cake in the back, and we've got to honor our illustrious ex mayor. So thank you. Please join us. All right. Well, thanks for the cake, everybody, and thanks especially to Pam here. Um, okay, and we can rearrange seats next time around if we need to. Um, is, are you good with that? I love this. Good. <laughs> um, traditionally, the vice mayor sits down that side where I was. So. Um, so the next thing on the agenda we have is a presentation of the 2010-2011 audit by Catherine Yuen of Mays Associates Accountancy Corporation. And this is our finance director, and he'll take it from here. Yes, uh, this, this item uh, comes on the agenda tonight. Uh, you've, been, you've had your uh, forms distributed to you. You've also seen the financial statements distributed to you in PDF uh, within the last three weeks or month. Tonight we have Catherine Yuan. She's the uh, uh, w manager for the audit uh, and with Mays Associates. Which there are auditors over in uh, in uh, Pleasant Hill, and uh, she has a presentation for us tonight on the audit. And uh, I'd like to welcome Catherine to to Fairfax. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, fellow council members. My name is Catherine Yuan uh, from Mason Associates. I'm uh, actually the engagement partner on the Fairfax audit, and thank you for having me again this year. Uh, I would like to present to you the 2011 basic financial statements, which you, I believe you have in front of you. Um, the result of the audit, the audit was completed on July 12, 2012, and the delay was due to staff changes over um, in the town's finance department. Uh, the town received an unqualified opinion for the city audit, which um, what it means is a clean opinion, and um, it's very important to understand that uh, we do not express a opinion on the internal control of the town. We did evaluate it during the audit. Uh, what we are saying is that the numbers reported on the financial statements are fairly stated. Um, the, uh, it fairly stated the positions of the town as of June 30th, 2011. During the audit, we also conducted a uh, federal grant audit, what we call the single audit, and there was no finding, which is a good thing. Okay, so um, in terms of the structure of the basic financial statement, um, what you see is that uh, you see the audit opinion followed by the management discussion and analysis, then the entity-wide financial statement, fund financial statements, notes to the basic financial statements, and then the required supplemental information, and then the supplemental information. On pages 3 to 10, you will see the management discussions and analysis. Uh, this document was prepared by the town management to provide an overview of the town's activity and financial performance for the fiscal year. Um, that includes management analysis of significant changes when compared to last year. And uh, please read that in conjunction with the rest of the financial statements and footnotes. If I can have your attention and turn to page 12 of the financial statements. Uh, the statement of net assets that presents the financial positions of the town at June 30th, 2011. As of June 30th, 2011, total assets amounted to $11 million. Um, the major categories of the total assets were capital assets totaled $8.1 million and cash and investment totaled $2.6 million. Details of capital assets can be found in note four. Details of cash and investments can be found in note two. 
total liabilities amounted to $7.8 million, uh, which was mostly long-term debt, which was $6.6 .6 million. And you can find the details of long-term debt in note five. Now, so the difference between the two is what we call the net assets, which amounted to $3.3 million. On page 14, you will see uh, the performance of general fund and the financial position as of that year. Uh, general fund held $1.7 million of cash and investments, and general fund had a net change in fund balance of a decrease of $287,000 for that year. Now, I would like to highlight uh, one of the footnotes for you tonight. Um, in note 1L, pages 30 to 31, um, in fiscal year 2011, the town implemented uh, one of the new GASBY pronouncement, the Governmental Accounting Standard Board Statement number 54, which reclassified the fund balances into five different categories. They are non-spendable, restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned. So those are all new categories, because I think you're used to reserved and unreserved fund balances. Um, the definition of the fund balances of these five categories can be found on page 30. And one of the categories that I would like to highlight is the um, committed fund balance. So if there are any formal council action to restrict a particular amount of fund balance, um, in that case, we will call that a committed fund balance. Now, an assigned fund balance in general fund amounted to $2.7 million, which was about 37% of the general fund's expenditures. Now, um, as an auditor, how we evaluate it is there is no requirement of how much fund balance a, an entity should hold for a government. However, um, the um, national organization uh, that we call the GFOA, the Governmental Officers um, Finance, wait, GF, okay, Government Financial Officers Association recommends a 15 to 20 percent of fund balance to be held um, of that uh, general funds expenditure or revenue. So um, when we compare that to the town's 37% of fund balance, that is a pretty healthy percentage. Okay. Um, the last thing that I want to point out is under uh, required supplemental information, pages 51 to 53, you can see a um, comparison of the town's budget versus the actual expenditure. Um, and it's listed out by original budget, final budget, and then actual numbers. <laughs> so, um, at this point, I would like to answer any questions that you may have. Do I have questions from council? The, the singular question which I ask every year is, this is all very technical stuff. The council delves into it with, with great attention. Um, we, we have an elected um, uh, you know, oversight through our town treasurer. Um, and of course, Michael Vivret studies it. Um, so so there's, there's a lot of redundancy here. But the most important question I think for any council member is to stare you straight in the eye and say, are you satisfied? Are we meeting the highest, highest standards of accountability uh, with regard to how we manage the community's money? Um, no I think that's, you know, technically, I cannot answer that question because, you know, I'm bound by my professional standard. I cannot just, you know, say that. Um, what I like to point out is that we did issue a manual and on internal control about, you know, issues that uh, we noted. And, um, and we didn't see any material weakness in the internal control. Um, the other thing that um, is a, 
is a little bit unique was that we conducted the audit after the year end. So a, a lot, we did a lot of look back. Um, you know, we were already 12 months late when we look at the audit. And it is my hope that we can catch up so that we can actually look at the operation while it is happening, you know, under the current staff. And I think that will give a better picture than looking at people that has already left the town and, and trying to figure out, trying to evaluate their operation. Because I, I think a lot of the comments that we have here, um, we formed based on the people has already left. So it didn't really help the town as much as if we can pr um, perform the audit during the year. And we will make sure that we follow your advice on this. Okay. Um, the, so, and I wanted to make sure we get Barbara Petty up here too and get her. The Finance Committee did have a chance to go through these in a little bit more detail um, with our Finance Director and our Town Treasurer. And um, and I, th I think I was certainly encouraged to, to look at all the indicators and there were certainly some indicators where you find problems. I mean, we're not, we're not you know, we're humans. <laughs> you know, our finance people are humans as much as we would love for them to be robots. No. Um, and I think that what we were in, emboldened by was the fact that there were less less challenges in this audit than the audit before this one and the ones that came forward were as you said not material weaknesses but a couple mm -hmm. of smaller deficiencies um, and I think that those, my understanding is those are sort of to be expected in the kind of general operating of a mm -hmm. of a town like this I, I think I mean this was my first uh, I'm sorry this was my third time mm -hmm. um, conducting the audit and if you look at the time frame every year the audit was a little bit more, uh, you know, we completed the audit a little bit faster than a year before. So I just hope that it will be, we can continue on that and so that you can have, you know, a, a normal audit in maybe two years or so. <laughs> yeah, I think that's certainly the intention is to, I mean, we are playing catch up and we've had mm -hmm. a, a series of finance directors and now with the, our current finance director, I think we're, I feel very confident and really appreciate a number of the changes that uh, Michael Bivret has done to make things more readable and understandable and, you know, and yes, this is a snapshot of what was going on two and a half years ago. So, mm -hmm. um, so it was reassuring to me that just, you know, this half a page of, of things, you know, only one major, um, uh, thing came up and you know there's a couple little details but um, it seems good to me do, do I have any other questions for I just had a quick question on this new terminology that you're using of unassigned and assigned funds so in in the past is internally we we have reserve funds set aside funds so what's how do you how do you classify something as an assigned or unassigned fund or is I mean I know you kind of touched on it but just sure there's three three different types there's committed assigned and I guess unassigned okay so that actually five different types uh, first there is unspendable um, usually that re refers to um, if the fund balance is already um, spent like if you already pay the prepaid or there is a long-term receivable out there. It's, it's not money that tomorrow, let's say, if something happened to the town, you can just turn around and use it. So that's non-spendable. Then there's restricted. Um, that has to be restricted by an outside source. So if, let's say, if you get a federal grant, then um, that particular amount will be restricted. Committed fund balance is what, uh, when the council takes action, then um, you decided that you're going to commit a special, uh, like a particular revenue source um, to, for special use, then that will be committed. And then um, assigned will be when uh, the finance director or city manager through the council action that you, you designate certain people that has the power to assign fund balance to put those money into a particular use then everything else will go under unassigned. 
the difference between this and um, what we used to call um, fund balance reserve is for, um, for the council to commit a fund balance, you have to commit an entire revenue source. So you can't just um, move, let's say, $1 million into capital project. You have to say, OK, well, um, if, if we get fees from parks and rec classes, uh, those fees can only be used for um, cultural activities. So it's, it's a little bit different than you know, what you're used to seeing. You're welcome. Well, um, Barbara, do you have any questions or? Barbara's our town treasurer, which is an elected position. Uh, we reviewed the financial statements at the, our finance committee meeting a couple of weeks ago, and my understanding was that this was a really clean audit. Um, and I think it just um, reflects on the staff's work. Um, both on the prior finance director and the current finance director who had to gather all the information for the auditor. Um, so I was pretty pleased with um, the financial statement and um, the auditor has said that this fairly presents what our town numbers look like and so that's what this report is all about. And um, we are in November 2012 so we are a little bit behind but not I don't feel like we're way out of our boundaries. And so if we can move that up a little bit for the next year and maybe a little bit more the next year, then we're gonna be right where we need to be. So I just wanted to thank the staff as well. So. Well, thank you. thank you. And are there any comments from the public? Thank you. Okay, well, thank great. Thank you very much. So do do we take action on this? It's just a presentation, I believe. Um, so next up on the agenda, we have a quarterly report from the General Plan Implementation Committee, which is an oral report. And um, it says planning. Um, and here he is. <laughs> to uh, introduce Bruce Ackerman, Chair of the General Plan Implementation Committee, and this is Diane Kazi on the committee also. Um, contrary to what's on your agenda tonight, this will be an oral report, but they are passing out a written report that will get up on the internet right away tomorrow so it's available to the public, but they're gonna walk you through that oral report, this written report orally right now. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Good evening. So the, uh, the General Plan Implementation Committee is, uh, in, in its formation, we were, uh, we were asked to present quarterly reports for at least the first year of our operation, and this is our second quarterly report. So I'll begin by saying that in, in this quarter, we feel like we've completed the initial tasks of organizing the committee. Uh, one of the things we needed to do was to adopt bylaws, or actually approve bylaws. You'll adopt them. So we, uh, one, one recommendation is that we have for you is that we would like you to look at the bylaws, which we've just distributed to you, and at your earliest convenience, consider approving them so that we have, or adopting them. I think that's the term, so that we have bylaws. Um, they're a little bit complex in, in terms of the fact that we in, included in the bylaws is a decision that, that we are recommending to adopt the Affordable Housing Committee as an adjunct committee to the GPIC. Um, and we have actually had one, one of our meetings in this quarter was a joint meeting with the Affordable Housing Committee, which I'll get to in a minute. And the also, the Fairfax Climate Action Committee is adopted as an adjunct committee as well. Currently, the Fairfax Climate Action Committee is identical in membership to the GPIC, so we, we are serving in that stead. Um, we, 
uh, but we we're asking you to, to consider it uh, being adopted as an adjunct committee so that we could possibly add if if other members were interested in joining the climate action committee they could do so and not have to join the gpic the gpic is has prescribed set of membership and so we we were we would recommend that we have that flexibility as to the membership of the of the uh, climate action committee so that's one recommendation is that you take a look at those bylaws so our our meetings in this quarter, uh, one, one meeting was joint with the Affordable Housing Committee, and we heard an excellent presentation from the, uh, regarding the Christ Lutheran Church um, site. The, that was, uh, that, the, it's, that would be called the Peace Village. Um, and that, that committee was very, that, that presentation was enlightening to us and, and uh, satisfied us, I believe, that that's moving along very nicely and it's a big part of what, of what we need to do under the general plan. And then the, uh, the next meeting, we had a fantastic presentation by the renewable, or uh, the resilient neighborhoods group. And a recommendation that we have for town council is that you consider inviting resilient neighborhoods to do a similar presentation to town council here so that we get a nice public look at what they are doing. Uh, they are doing some excellent work in a uh, community-based approach to tackling residential um, energy conservation and, and simultaneously with the energy conservation, there's resilient neighborhoods, as their name implies. They it would increase resiliency of individuals, households, and neighborhoods, and the town to uh, all sorts of things, challenges which might come our way, including just storms. Uh, we we increase our resiliency as we get a handle on our on our resource use, and it increases community. It builds community. So this is a a really strong model that Resilient Neighborhoods has put together. In fact, they are just now completing their pilot study, which pilot project, which was to involve 100 households. It's actually involved a little more than 100 households. And they were hoping in their pilot project to, to save at least 5,000 pounds per year of carbon emission per household. And they have way exceeded that in terms of what they have achieved in that first year. So I would highly recommend, or we would highly recommend that we get them to give a presentation here to council. We are um, in our, uh, very soon here in our next meeting, which will be not tomorrow, but the next Thursday, and these are open meetings, anybody is invited. Uh, we will be tackling the climate, uh, the, the um, um, the carbon action plan for climate action plan, carbon action plan for Fairfax. Uh, that will be under our under our role as being the FCAC, the Fairfax Climate Action Committee. But that's uh, we expect that resilient neighborhoods will be a part of that plan. We we see that as a, a very good um, synergy between the community based approach that the general plan calls for to tackling climate change and the resilient neighborhoods community-based approach. So we're very excited about that and, and again invite people to attend next Thursday as we begin codifying these ideas. Um, and then the, the third meeting in this quarter was mostly working on our bylaws, which as I said we presented to you for, for approval, and preparing this quarterly report. So. Um, we have also prepared for you, and you have, I believe, the, a list of the first year programs from the, the general plan that have town council's name on them. Um, each of these programs has different responsible parties. Some of them have more than one responsible party, but all the ones that have town council as a responsible party that are listed for the first year are on that list and we're preparing similar reports for all the other bodies in town that have that are mentioned in these plans as well and then we see that as we go forward we'll be 
trying to sort of make the rounds with different groups and discuss these and, and prioritize and try to see synergies, see how we can see how we can try to get these done. It's quite a list. So, um, so um, again, the, the recommendations that we have would be to take a look at the bylaws, to study those uh, that list pretty carefully and, and think about how this fits in with, with what we're already doing and um, to be involved with the climate action plan because this is going to be. And just one word about the climate action plan, it's in addition to the community-based approach, we're taking, we, we intend to take the approach and I think, uh, I think will as we discuss it, that the climate action approach in Fairfax would be focused not only on government operations but on residential uh, because that is the largest the largest part of what we're doing as a town. We're mostly residential, so we really need to step beyond some climate action plans that don't really tackle that because government can't do much about it and really try to challenge ourselves to ask what can we do about residential energy conservation and, and uh, improvement of how we treat our climate. So, any questions? <clears throat> It's, it's always odd to um, hear a conversation about something that's so aspirational and then follow it up with something so mundane. Uh, but on, uh, and I would ask council this also, with regard to the um, adoption of the bylaws, what role does the council play and do we have to formally agendize this for them? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. Okay. And in fact, there's been an error here in the agenda uh, for this matter. This, the agenda states oral reports, so you need to uh, keep your consideration to the oral report. Also, documents that are prepared by the town that are for the council's consideration can't be used by you or considered at a meeting unless they're also provided to the public. So you really need to uh, you know, limit your consideration of this report to what, what Bruce said tonight. And, and at a subsequent meeting, uh, a more complete report will be put back on. Thank you. I think it's really exciting. I, I'm, I'm watching the progress has just been extraordinary, and I love that the, the the hard work is just is rolling, rolling quickly and and efficiently. So thanks a lot. It's good work. Yes, thank you very much, Bruce. And and speaking also as one of the GPAC members, because I am the council representative on this on the general plan implementation committee and the climate action committee and the, all the other alphabet soup things that you represent. Um, but this resilient community things that you have put forward here is, I mean, its objective is to give people tools to lower their carbon footprint. Very relatively simple things that you can do, and they not only do that, that they enable you to understand where grants come from to do energy uh, efficiency things in your home, and um, saves you money, too, to boot. Um, and really what the GPAC is looking for is to develop a toolbox that, you know, stretches to fit what people need in Fairfax. And it's, it's kind of a, um, it, it's, a it's not a ready-made solution. It's, it's kind of a, a basket of tools. And we're hoping to have it um, stretch to fit a bunch of different scenarios and really work for people. And, get feedback from people and develop this so that more people can use it both in Fairfax and other places also. So uh, it seems exciting, seems like a lot of work, uh, but it's good work to do. So thank you very much, Bruce. I have a, a personal interest, considerable interest in the, in the climate and energy arena. And uh, what Resilient Neighborhoods is doing is really brilliant. Uh, this has been a tough nut to crack across the country, how, how we actually move the needle on residential energy conservation. Uh, the, the typical way that it's done is to say, well, you can save money if you do certain things. And frankly, utility bills are so cheap by, compared with the, by comparison with what they really cost us in terms of climate effects and in terms of the wars that we fight in order to protect our sources of energy and the environmental destruction that we create by, by digging up that fossil energy generally, that it's, it's really the cost uh, motivation doesn't go very far with most people. We have busy lives and uh, we can spend our time somewhere else and probably gain more cost. 
So what Resilient Neighborhoods has done is to turn this around and focus on the community aspect of it. So they actually uh, promote, the, they, they gather together a group of maybe eight or 10 households and those, those households meet and support each other and with a lot of help from the Resilient Neighborhoods organization, they pick, as you said, through a menu of many interesting choices and they decide what they can do each individually. They support each other to do them and the, uh, the results have been fantastic and it, it really is creating community at the same time. So that seems to be, it seems to be just a perfect fit for Fairfax because this is, this is the kind of thing that we could see happening here and, and really getting some traction. So we're very excited about it. Yeah. Well, looking forward to seeing how it plays out. So, thank you. Bruce, who is, who are resilient communities? Is it a nonprofit? Is it a, a think tank? Is it? I assume they're organized as a nonprofit. Um, they're, they, they, and they have a website, resilientneighborhoods.org, I believe, um, and which is informative. It actually shows photographs of a lot of the, the groups that have formed and, and um, talks about their approach. Uh, the presentation was given to us by, by two principal people uh, from Resilient Neighborhoods who have, it's a pretty small organization, it, it appears. They now have a couple of interns, but it's basically a couple of people who are really organizing this. So their challenge as Resilient Neighborhoods, and we discussed this with them at, at the presentation, uh, will be to figure out how to bring this to a larger scale. And that seems to be the area that we might be able to help them with as a town to sort of adopt them as a, and other towns have as well. The, the, I, I believe it's written into the, the uh, is it written into the general plan for San Rafael? It's, it's in, it's, San Rafael is working to work with them as well. Uh, but we can, uh, we can do, for try to find creative ways, really, of supporting what they're what they're up to and of integrating them into our work in the town. So we see it as a true partnership, not just sort of asking them to do the work for us, but really helping them to grow, helping them to use use our town as a model of what can really be done. Good. Checking out their Thank website is, is really website really is? informative. Resilientneighborhoods.org, I believe. Yeah, and it did. It started under the umbrella of Sustainable Marin, but I don't know that it's still under that umbrella or not. Mm -hmm. I know they're part, they're part of the collaboration, but that's how it's, that's how it began. Yeah, but just to say, for instance, school started in Fairfax and you know grew to the you know more than Manor School. It was the town program, then a county program, then a California one. Now it's national. Um, this has that same potential. I mean, really, you know, we have a populace here that is, uh, you know, respond, you know, it, it cares about climate change and, um, or at least a certain large percentage of people do. And um, the hope is to develop something that works for Fairfax and then, then resilient neighborhoods can use this to replicate in other areas too, using the tools we develop here. So, so it sounds like a win-win. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Um, are there any comments from the public about this? Well, hearing none, I'll close that, uh, that public comment time. Um, now is the time for open time for public ex expression. There's a three limit minute limit per person. If you wish to address the council, please approach the podium and state your name and address. Individuals have three minutes to speak, or if you're representing a group, if you have five minutes. This is the time set aside for individuals wishing to address the council on matters not listed on the agenda. State law, um, and there's a government code section here, um, provides that council not is not permitted to take action and strictly limits the right of the council to discuss any unagendized item unless it can be demonstrated to be of an emergency nature or the need to take immediate action arose after the posting of the agenda. So, um, yes, you're first. Hi, I'm back. Um, Misty Moreno, Nine Park Road. Um, I came mostly to say my thank yous. Um, it's been two and a half years since I started my battle 
to be able to sleep all night. Um, 2010 in May is when it started. Um, I want to thank everybody involved, Judy Anderson, Jim Moore, Chief Moore, and um, every one of you up there, especially Mr. Weinshoff, who in my state of mind was the voice of reason. Um, but for all of you, your votes, I totally appreciate. And oddly enough, I want to thank um, Councilman O'Neill also for his doggedly probing questions that finally, after two and a half years, got us to the point that, oh yeah, it was for personal financial gain, not service to the community. Um, even though you voted with me in October and against me in November, you got the information out there that I think is what changed the vote. Um, the price I've paid for this is that I can no longer shop at 7-Eleven or any of his stores, which resulted in an amazingly quiet weekend. This last weekend was our first time, and it was shocking. Our bodies were so used to it. It was shockingly quiet. Um, we don't have, this is all we have. This is our home. And we don't have five, six, seven, eight other locations to go to on Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, Napa, Petaluma, wherever his other locations are, all of which operate 24 hours except for this one. I don't bleed for his pocketbook and I don't have, this is a, what we have. There was also the question, um, one of the 7-Eleven employees brought up uh, the property value of our property, um, which was, I think, nobody's business and shouldn't have been introduced, but as I believe most of us here know, that it doesn't only count when you're selling your property. We raised a second family there. We have four girls. That's four college educations to pay for. God willing, they'll pay for their own weddings. But <laughs> equity in our home is everything. Um, all that being said, I would like to bring up the topic which I brought up um, a year or a year and a half ago and with some direction from all of you is um, they are reapplying under different conditions and they are an international corporation and they will continue to do that. I brought up a year or a year and a half ago that I thought we should consider an amendment to the town code or however that language works that a business who shares a property line with a full-time residence not be allowed to stay open after midnight i would really appreciate your direction on how i can address that because i don't want to be doing this every year with the corporation of seven eleven who were by the way seven eleven when we bought our property. Great. Thank you. That's it. Do I get any any information? You can't do that under our oh, okay. Yeah, we, so yeah, that I would part approach... of that thing is we can't take action on something. Okay, this so is... you just hear me out. I thank you for that, and um, I will proceed. Thank you all very, very much. Is that better? Okay. Um, I would like to, as every meeting, ask what the closed session was. And I would like to actually have the policy in town that we start discussing this. And before the answer is given to me, I brought a copy of California Government Code Procedure uh, 54959, excuse me, 56.9, which dictates why the council should, I guess, advise the public of what these closed sessions are. The only time that the council can really be excluded from that, um, A, <coughs> the town's gonna be plaintiff, and they're afraid that it can jeopardize their standing on where they may or may not be able to serve even a plaintiff, so that's where they're defendant. Um, if the town feels that there is some sort of legal discussion at that time that will compromise their position, and providing it qualifies that there's been no written notice or any reasonable notice that the town has received. All these cases I don't think have been met 
and I'd really appreciate if the town can go forward in the future and start providing this information to the town because I feel it just makes it opaque. I brought a copy of this government of California procedure. I'd like to drop it off, Jim, and I'd like to ask that question again. If you can please disclose whether it's a letter from Paul Smith, whatever it is, if we can have a policy, including tonight's closed session, to be made public. And excuse me, it was on the agenda, so it can be discussed. Um, can you state your name for the record and your address so that it goes on the record who's speaking? Michael McIntosh, 60 Pastore Avenue. Yeah, and I think we'd have to defer to counsel also. I mean, I think that we've gone around on this a few times. There's, you know, on, on the agenda, I mean, it's... The question is um, whether or not you, the council wishes to um, disclose further information from the closed session than it already has. And in my opinion, we've disclosed what we're legally required to do. Um, so you can, if you want to disclose more information about the closed sessions or the topic or, or not. But I think that's the request that's been put forward. Yes. Brown Act is a very long set of statutes, uh, and and my correct and okay, and um, your position, in my opinion, is wrong. So that's I have nothing more to say about. It. I'm their lawyer, not yours. So um, if you have a more elaborate, elect, uh, you know, explanation, you can send it in. We can take a look. Well, at might, it. might I suggest? Um, I can recall when um, the late Stan Schriebman was here and people um, scoffed at his um, expansive interpretation of the Brown Act um, with regard to particularly closed session items and, and different things. And, and through the years, Stan, um, through his diligence, his intelligence, um, and his doggedness managed to move the town rather, um, I think, in the direction that he wanted, um, which was to a more uh, open conversation. I would ask that town council spend the time and the money. And let's get to the, you, you've come month after month, much like Stan, and I think you've made a reasoned um, uh, request and you've made an analysis of, of you know, certain government code statutes. I don't know if you're right or you're wrong. Um, so I would say, I would like, and if we have to agendize this to expend the funds, fine, but I think that when a citizen comes forward, um, well-meaning as you are, uh, that we get a, a formal legal opinion on this and then it will be resolved at least as to, well, me, and I suspect the other members of the council as well who, who rely and respect on council's decision. I appreciate that. You have to hit the thing. I appreciate that because I remember once before I brought that up about the uh, Berg litigation and Larry put it on the agenda so we could discuss and I appreciate that. Um, if you'd like, you know, bearing my little glasses with the lighting here, I can even read to you the very clear, concise language why we should disclose this to the public and any exclusions that would preclude that information, which I do not believe are present. And in the past, in fairness, too, to the council, uh, Jim has been very gracious a couple times, like after these council meetings, and has sent me this information. But a lot of times when I make these requests, it's not really just on my behalf. I just feel that the entire town can move in a much more... Um, informed direction if we have a less opaque behind closed session and make this more public. So my requests that are very continual here are really so that it's disclosed to the general public, not just be sent to me, although I appreciate when I make those requests, you know, for the FOIAs or anything else. If we make this general public information, I feel that we can all make a better decision. And I think at the end of the day, it would require less t staff time to respond to my requests and certainly less money from town council to then dictate a letter and send it off to me. So if we can make this. Well, I think what, what we're asking council to do is to analyze your request and to uh, prepare a memorandum. You're looking yeah, at me. I, I, think, I think what you need to do, if, you, if, you, if his request was that, that relates to what's on the agenda is to disclose information about the closed sessions tonight. That you, you apparently don't want to do. If you want to look at a broader question, I think you need to agendize that. Then we will agendize it. Judy, if you would. Yeah, we could bring that forth later. I mean, yes? Uh, you know, um, I, I'm fine getting a memo from our attorney about it. 
Um, you have made numerous uh, public records acts requests to the town of Fairfax. Uh, very costly for the town of Fairfax. Uh, I, I'm fine bringing it up uh, and discussing it. Uh, I, I think our council has always adhered very closely to the Brown Act uh, for all the years that I've been on it. And uh, I guess the, what I have a problem with is the implication that we haven't been hewing to the Brown Act. So um, I just want to make my position clear. I believe we have been doing that. Um, if you know the council's desire is to is to have our attorney write a memorandum that we can put on uh, for public discussion, I'm fine with that. But I just want to make my position clear. Uh, we we have adhered very closely to the Brown Act. We always have. This council was the first council that, when funding was cut off for the Brown Act, we explicitly agreed to follow each and every dictate of the Brown Act. So, um, yeah, le by all means, let's have a further discussion. And, and we have been getting very specific advice from our attorney, which, and we have been, we have been following, uh, I believe, the statute to a T. But if, you know, the council wants to make this an agenda item, I'm fine with it. What I have a problem with is the implication and the insinuation to the public that we haven't. Okay, we'll see this where we, this where we on the mic. Push the mic. Are you yeah. three I'm sure I am. So if we could do that, I'd we really should. appreciate it. Okay, and I appreciate the discussion back and forth with the input. Um, Jim has a copy of the procedure, and if we could look at that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We look forward to that in the future. Yes, Tony. Tony Utis, 7 Forest Terrace, Fairfax. Um, tonight, I'm down here to speak to you about this uh, general plan appendix to TCA LC Bank Roadway Improvements. And um, I just really think this is a great disconnect from the public. And if it was to go out to vote right now, I seriously don't think it would happen. And in the framework of it being framed up as part of the general plan, it feels like it's almost being forced upon the public to abide by it. And after reviewing the report written by uh, the Crane Traffic Associate Engineers, um, they didn't mention anything about the impact in the surrounding communities, such as Dominga, uh, Merwin Park Forest and I really don't think people that are going to be coming from uh, San Anselmo into Fairfax and going to Deer Park and then go all the way up to Bank Street make the turn and go down on Bolinas and go to Deer Park they're going to go up Porteous or they're going to go up Forest and that's going to be the same way on the other side here with Mariner and stuff and the amount of money we spent already on this Nice. The amount of money we spent on this could have been spent on other things such as the infrastructure. And by pursuing this any further, I just think it's a waste of our money and it doesn't really reflect the community. You know, And I think if you honestly took a poll out there, closing down Bolinas Road to two-way traffic, making it one-way traffic, putting two more new traffic lights in the town already, and causing cars to climb an elevation and come back down again, isn't very green. And I don't see any sense in it, and I think it would be rather costly to the taxpayers. It could be spent on fixing my road. It hasn't been paved since 1976, and the bridge that comes down from Forest down to Dominga, that's going to be needing to replace. The tunnel that empties out from the police department into the creek back there is all undermined and has potential of falling into the creek and eroding and causing more damage. So I really think that if there needs to be improvements downtown, the, the improvements should be made, fix the sidewalks. I don't think it should be held over our head to have to take this on in order to fix our sidewalks and stuff. So as far as a taxpayer, I, I think that we could spend our money in better ways that would serve the community better. Thank you. All right, so is there any other public comments? Seeing none, I'll close the um, open time for uh, 
public expression. So next up is council reports and comments. Um, and you can start on your end, David. Sure. A um, number of us attended a number of these meetings, so it'll uh, overlap. Uh, John and I were, of course, at the, uh, at the fire board um, meeting. Uh, a number of us also attended, I think it was um, Larry and, and John and myself, Judy, uh, also attended the MMWD uh, monthly meeting for uh, mayors and, uh, or the MCCMC meeting for uh, mayors and council members in which we heard a presentation by the columnist uh, Dick Spotswood who uh, recapped the election uh, season, the November election season for all of us. Um, Larry and I were also at the uh, MMWD meeting, and, and as was Ryan, um, dealing with the um, uh, vegetation management plan as it begins its, uh, its long walk toward uh, visiting us in, in final form uh, sometime, I believe, next year. Um, John and I attended uh, the uh, school district meeting. The school district is beginning its... Uh, well, it's uh, baptism under fire, I guess, this week, uh, particularly dealing with, with the flood issue. Uh, and uh, John and I, um, staff, Supervisor Rice, um, all were able to begin to bring the school district into the important conversation as the owners of Lefty Gomez Field and, and the role that um, flood protection uh, will be gained from turning that into a detention base. And, and I, I think, John, you would agree that actually I think the school district was as uh, knowledgeable as we ever could have imagined and also open to the, uh, the challenges um, and the possibilities of beginning to move that toward a detention pond. That was even before the great rains of, of last week. Um, in that vein, I also joined Joined Supervisor Rice to meet with, um, well, now uh, Congressman-elect uh, Jared Huffman. This was the, the end of his time, and we began to talk about uh, the importance of Corps of Engineer funding for what's called Unit 4, uh, the dredging project at the bottom of the uh, Corte Madera um, Creek. Uh, that will obviously have to be done and paid for by the federal government in large measure uh, because as you know if you're going to clean out the the bathtub if you don't scour out the uh, the thing at the bottom you might as well not be uh, cleaning up the top of the tub and, and that's pretty much it we we really have to have a very um, aggressive continuous and expensive um, dredging commitment from the federal government and I think uh, Congressman uh, Huffman got that, and I know that uh, Supervisor Rice has also met with uh, staff for uh, Senators uh, Feinstein and Boxer, and uh, this is a very, very important issue. Um, and, and finally, I um, periodically get invited to uh, teach the government or economics class at Drake, and I can uh, report uh, that uh, the students uh, remain um, as smart as ever. In, in, our, uh, in, in our high school, their questions were adroit, they were to the point, they were incisive, um, they understood their community and, and the concerns, um, and it was, as always, um, a great delight to see what the future will bring us. So thank you. Uh, I attended a number of uh, zero waste meetings, uh, both with our sort of contractee, Sustainable Fairfax, as well as um, our finance director and um, interim town manager were working out the contract that we approved with them and what, how that potentially moves forward. Um, and there'll be a report on that in January. I met with the Chamber of Commerce folks in our regular monthly meeting, the finance meeting in a regular monthly meeting. Um, and then a, a numerous hours in our in our seeking of a new of a new town manager and interviews and, and meetings and what have you. Um, and my, my tough meeting of the month was with a third grader who also asked very <laughs> um, uh, very tough questions of the mayor. So I'm happy to be passing those interviews on to you. <laughs> oh, thanks for that. Larry. Um, I would say the, the most interesting meeting for the public is this whole process that the Marin Water District is undertaking, which uh, used to be called the Vegetation Management Plan and is now called the you know, Fire, Fire Protection and uh, Environmental Improvement Plan. So they managed to sort of uh, change the title and reframe uh, the, the impetus uh, of the report. Um, and, and, and I think it's going to present some pretty big challenges to our community and some pretty big opportunities to our community. I mean, this whole thing sort of started 
when Fairfax uh, discovered uh, MMWD employees in hazmat suits spraying pesticides in the watershed above Fairfax. And our council immediately passed a resolution of concern and asked them to implement a uh, temporary uh, stay on any further pesticide spraying in, in the watershed. Um, and that, that has been in effect for five or six years. There's been no pesticide, no herbicide application in the watershed that we know of. At least it's not been official policy. Um, I, I think as we move forward, I think there's still a uh, critical mass of people I know in Fairfax that want, that believe the watershed is a sacrosanct area. It is, it's the source, it's the collection area for our drinking water. And so it's a little bit different than other uh, property or parkland or open space that the community enjoys. But I think as we move forward, I think how we may be able to reconcile uh, there's the conflicting interests between pesticide uh, activists, people that oppose the use of pesticides and other toxic chemicals in the watershed. And there's a competing group of people that are very concerned about the biological diversity that some of these invasive, so-called invasive species present because the broom, the scotch broom and the French broom, it is inexorably increasing in the amount of space that it's taking up. And some, there's a very well-educated and well-spoken group of people in our community that feel that that presents a threat to the biological diversity, the, the native biological diversity that's been present in the watershed. And in, in thinking about how to reconcile these two somewhat conflicting interests, I, I think what we've got to do is kind of rethink how we manage that watershed because the watershed is no longer just the collection point for our water. It's become a recreational asset it's become a property value asset. It's, it's an emotional resource for our community. There's so many of us that go to the watershed for recreation, to clear our heads, to walk our dogs, that I think we're gonna need to start recognizing that the management of those lands should be a separate issue and a separate um, almost a separate budget from the money and the revenue that's being generated by our water use because we all know that we need to conserve water. So why should the management of the water district lands suffer because we're conserving water? So I, I think as we go forward and what, what I'm going to be really advocating for is whether ratepayers are willing to pay a small monthly fee for watershed management. And it could be anywhere from two to five dollars a month, and we would have a dedicated fund to manage that watershed in, in a way that would reconcile those interests, the biological diversity interests, the folks that are, are against the use of pesticide, the bicyclists, the recreational users that all have a stake in the watershed, separate and apart from the amount of water that it's generating and, and the sale of water. So I think that's a critical issue for the community to really keep an eye on in the next year because it's, it's, it's going forward and uh, it's a very important issue that affects all of us, our health and a lot of us, you know, our, our lives every day, how we live our lives in, in, in this community. So. I just wanted to kind of put that out there and uh, we'll, we'll keep you uh, apprised. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan? He is a tough act to follow. He kills you with common sense. Um, I'll, I'll touch on uh, the, some of the more important aspects of what I did over the month. Um, the tree committee is in full effect during the storm months when most people don't actually realize that they might have something coming down on their home until the storms come in and they hear things or it's a little bit more of a menacing 
uh, around their home. Um, I've gone out on uh, five or six emergency tree permits, so um, w the, the tree committee always gets more applications at this time of year, but um, you know, a lot of these things do come down in storms. Uh, uh, usually, uh, which leads me into um, on December 2nd, this past uh, Saturday, I believe it was December 2nd, um, there was a lot of rain, and if you follow the Ross Valley Fire flood tables, when you see that the uh, the flood levels got to over seven feet, that um, I hauled my tail down to the uh, the town hall only to see um, the police chief, the fire chief, uh, Judy was on scene, and um, the town is very prepared for floods. Um, I on my way down, um, usually I when it gets really bad. I'm usually out there trying to clear drains. The community was amazing. Um, nobody works floods like our community. I mean, I, I drove down Cascade at 7 in the morning and I saw five neighbors uh, clearing out their, their their storm drains together. I actually pulled over my, my car and rolled down the window and said, hey, nothing pulls a group of neighbors together better than a storm in the morning on Fairfax. I mean, there were five neighbors and they were all out there in their rain gear at 7 a.m. Um, and we know how to get through those things, but um, it just reminds me from my Boy Scout background to be prepared, um, be prepared for outages. We had a transformer that blew on Lower Cascade. Uh, we were without power for almost 24 hours. And um, although uh, my background has us with candles, uh, food and stuff like that, um, you don't know what you don't have till you don't have it. And I think uh, it's a good reminder to us as we go into storm season that everybody really needs to make sure that they are prepared with, um, with rations and power and a plan. Um, big props to Judy and the fire chief and the police chief. Uh, we were inches away uh, from uh, big water, and um, I think it has a lot to do with the preparation of the public, uh, the public um, works department, um, clearing drains and pulling things out. And um, you may not see that at your homes at nine o'clock when the water went down, but at seven o'clock when all hell almost broke loose, it was because you had a lot of dedicated people on the staff um, doing their job and a lot of concerned citizens that know where the hotspots are that cleared those out. And um, most people didn't know that. Um, uh, I won't take too much of my time talking about what Larry talked about, but the municipal water district um, meeting was an eye opener for me. Um, some of you may know I did turn in an application for this spot for the uh, Water District Board. Um, and I went to this meeting uh, in San Rafael and I noticed uh, a lot of people were very active and concerned. This was a sequel analysis scope, so there wasn't really action being taken, but they were considering what people were talking about and what they wanted to see included in the sequel analysis. Um, there was a lot of very in informed and intelligent people there. When I hear a lot of informed and intelligent people speaking on a topic, it really piques my interest. And I think when you hear the passion and what Larry's talking about, um, it should pique your interest as well. Um, I was not chosen to be uh, interviewed for that water board position, and, and, I, and I understand that. Um, but as the only elected official that turned in an application for that, um, it makes me think that these are things that we need to watch as a community um, beyond Fairfax to the whole Ross Valley because these decisions um, Nothing should be more important than human health. And when we hear pesticides um, in Fairfax, we may have a different opinion of them, but um, that, that's something that we all have to be very aware of and keep our eyes on it and, and, and ask for transparency so we do what's right. Well, thank you, Ryan, for that. And um, I uh, want to underline what you said. I think that it was phenomenal the amount of work that our public works and staff went towards basically averting a big disaster this last weekend and you know you know from getting here at 5:30 or whatever it was you know, I mean different individuals there was a whole gang of people uh, dealing with an imminent flooding situation and fortunately it went back down and um, and I think that it wouldn't have gone down quite so rapidly as as uh, Ryan had just described um, so I wanted to say thanks um, even though everybody's not here, that's on, on behalf of the council here. Um, let me see, I will skip over, I went to a bunch of different meetings, uh, just asked my wife, I'm away a lot, and uh, just, you know, she doesn't complain too much, so thank you. Um, but um, let me see, the, the GPIC meeting, uh, at the fire board meeting, um, we also um, talked about, uh, you know, that, um, uh, David mentioned. We also talked about going forward for another uh, 
trying to get a another round of grant for ch funding Chipper Day, where you know go around and do chipping in the neighborhoods. Um, the uh, town of Ross and Sleepy Hollow area are also interested in that sort of thing, and that might uh, be going forward un under uh, um, Marine Fire as this sponsor to do the paperwork with it. Uh, and they have not yet opened the. You know, we don't know what the matching funds are going to be this next go around, and that's probably going to be in the next couple of months. Um, spent time doing things with volunteers and trail stuff and the families committee, of course. Um, one interesting meeting that I went to last week was uh, the Transportation Authority of Marin, and I am very pleased to say that Fairfax is the recipient of a grant for $300,000 to um, address the uh, downtown Fairfax parkade, uh, a lot of ADA improvements, pedestrian improvements, bike lanes on Broadway, and um, so we're pleased to get awarded that. So, so hooray for Fairfax. Um, th this is an important part of the East-West Corridor, and, and people Everybody lives here, and they know how hard it is sometimes to cross the street or you know ride a bike safely down that stretch. And so um, this is a long time coming, so we're happy about that. Um, and um, let me see, Fairbuck meetings and stuff like that. People have heard about those before, right? <laughs> um, that's going forward. Uh, Fairbucks will be on uh, sold at the Good Earth starting tomorrow. Um, and uh, you can buy them in bags of seven if you want. You can also um, get them up at the uh, Fairfax Pavilion for the uh, Crafts Fair uh, this Saturday from, what is it? 11 to 4. 11 to 4. Great. And so that concludes um, my report. So, Judy, I think you're up next. I don't really have much to report. I went to a few meetings, too. Um, the MCCMC, the Chamber, the Zero Waste, the Finance, the Search Committee, and so forth. I wanted to reiterate what you said about the storm. I got there early Sunday, but when I got there uh, Sunday morning, Chief Morin already had everything in hand. I mean, he had called in extra dispatcher. He had uh, just everything was really in place, and there was nothing for me to do. He had it all sorted, and I wanted to acknowledge him for that. Also, our public works crew, when I started in 1989, we had six members of the crew. We now have three, and we have an extra guy we can call in. And what those guys do uh, to prepare for a storm, during a storm, I mean, I know from the number of calls we get, I'm sure people think we have batteries of people to do all this work. The guys are amazing. They accomplish a tremendous amount. They go out, they check all the trouble spots over and over again. I don't know how many times they were down on Hill Avenue with that pump that just couldn't handle the capacity, didn't have the capacity. And uh, the police officers, the staff, everybody really pitched in, as did the council members. They came down to see if there was something they could do. And, you know, I, I just uh, agree with the sentiments that you expressed about our citizens. They all know in their neighborhood where the problem spots are and they know what to do and they really help us and uh, just working together we avoid a lot of trouble and uh, this was a real close one and a wake up for some of us about being more prepared but um, I think we can be proud of our community and proud of our staff for really handling it and uh, doing a great job so that's all I wanted to say. Oh, actually, there's one more thing I want to say. I think the the public, and I'm going to try and do a better job of educating people about how to put in a maintenance request to the Public Works Department. We have this wonderful program called iWorks. And if you go onto our website and you go on the Public Works Department, there's a place that you click for uh, Public Works Maintenance Request. When you do that, a screen pops up and you can put your name and what the problem is. You're assigned a number, then you can go back and check the status of that request. So it's a very efficient system and we do use it and it really helps the guys, especially when there's so few of them and they're so busy, 
to have this system to fall back on. So, you know, if somebody calls us, then we fill out one of those requests and we track it. But it's available to everyone in the public. And I'm, I have it on, you know, I'm trying to put it out there whenever we have a chance as an informational item. But just if you could spread the word you were in the audience, that it's a wonderful system and it's really efficient and allows you to track your requests. So, you know, whether it's a street light that's out or anything that's public works related, not just during a storm, it's a wonderful system. So just a little plug for iWorks on our website. Great, thank you. Um, let me see, and I guess from here we'll move on to the consent calendar. Um, and uh, is can I make I, a, yes? Um, I got a, a small typo on the uh, the minutes. Do you want to pull it and just, just tell, just tell her what it is? Yeah. Uh, it says Judy on page two that Council Member O'Neill reported that he attended a Ross Valley Fire Board. That did not happen, and okay. I did not say that. <laughs> No, I saw you. John? Yeah. Mayor, yes. Um, uh, can we pull a number 11, which is the uh, resolution rescinding the award? Right. Yeah. Just have, have a brief, sure, have have a a brief, brief discussion brief, about brief that. Brief discussion about that. Okay. Well, um, are there any other issues with anything else on the consent? Well, do I hear a motion to uh, approve um, consent calendars items 5 through 10? Uh, I'm sorry, is there any public comment on any of the art, uh, items on consent calendar? These are items 5 through 10 on the agenda. Oh, then I'll move the consent calendar with the exception of number 11. Second. Okay, we have a uh, motion winds off, a second uh, Hartwell. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? None. So, um, thank you. And I guess then we'd move on to um, item number 11. Thank you. Uh, I, the reason I ask that it be pulled is um, I, I don't really have any problem with the request to rescind the contract. I guess the, the contractor didn't comply with certain of our um, requirements as far as going out and um, looking for is it minority contractors or? It's a federal requirement for this project to, um, for them to show a good faith effort for disadvantaged business enterprise. So, so a set we, of standards that they didn't meet. So, so we, we need to comply with that, there's no doubt. The reason I asked to um, pull it is because I got a call from Andy Perry, um, who is, you know, um, are you the executive director now, the Bike Coalition? Okay. And he brought it to my attention that some of the area that is, that is going to be striped is really not paved adequately for a bike lane. So we, would we consider, when we put this thing out again, maybe expanding the bid package a little bit so that we can get the needed improvements within our budget to do so. May I just explain what's happened before? Yeah. Yes. We, we, this is the third time we put this out to bid. The first time, uh, we didn't get any bids. And it's the feeling of our uh, consulting engineer that we didn't get bids because we included in the package paving portions some paving. We had to broaden uh, Sir Francis Drake at one point to allow for the paving. And nobody bid on the package. And then um, they decided, our engineer decided that we didn't get any bids because most striping companies don't have the equipment to do paving. So um, we went out again with just striping and we got bids from striping companies. So meanwhile, we still needed this part of the road to be expanded for the um, bike lanes. Um, so we did that as a separate informal bid. Major and Gelati had been in town doing our repaving projects and they bid on the project 
with the understanding that usually when they go in the roads, they go underneath and the roads have other work that needs to be done. And so they, they bid higher to allow for that. And our roads were in pretty good shape. So their bid came in quite a bit under. The cost came in quite a bit under. So we contracted with them, with their equipment, to do that expansion as a separate piece of the road paving contract. So we didn't need to include that with the striping. The striping was done separately, so we'd get bids from striping companies. So I'm hesitant to add a paving portion to the striping project that will come with the same problem again where striping companies don't. So I think if we decide to do that, we probably should just bid it as an informal project, an informal paving project. Yeah. The, the bike spine, um, I have been talking to David Parisi, who's our consultant on that, on just riding that spine just mm -hmm. to check out the pavement condition before we start putting those right. expensive medallions on the pavement. That when we get that scheduled, we could probably just ride by this area that's going to be striped and just take a look at it and see. But just, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe we don't need to delay putting the bid package out, I don't know, but maybe if we could just wait until we do that inspection before we put this striping okay. bid package out again okay. for a couple weeks. So we, we need to change, well, we could, the resolution says we're rescinding this uh, award of bid and we're releasing the um, plans and specs. So we can, you can authorize that with the understanding that we're going to evaluate the roadways and if you want. Well, my, just as a matter of procedure, could okay. we just hold putting out the bid Absolutely. package for a couple of weeks? Absolutely. So that we don't have yeah. to change the resolution. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Yeah, and just to be clear on it, so we had rolled the, the paving that needed to be done on this section of the bike lanes that we're rescinding this particular project with already to Majorian and Gilotti, and they, had they paved that section already, and is that what Andy's reacting to, or? I don't know which sections he's referring to. I think he wasn't, I think he did inspect, we can have Andy speak to us, but I I, th I thought he looked at that section where they, Majora and Gelati, at, they had to widen Sir Francis Drake a little right. bit at one point to right. allow for the striping. And they, they performed that work? And they performed that work. Okay. Um, Andy, maybe you'd like to come forward and, thank you. Am I on? Yeah, there we go. Um, so, Andy Perry, Marin County Bicycle Coalition. Um, yeah, so the area in question, the area in question that the that Gelati brothers uh, did, or Gelati, majority Gelati, majority, lots of Gelatis out there, um, was between Olima near the home that on occasion has a, a car parked in their living room there, that house right after Olima Road. They did widen that portion there and they did, uh, it looks like a really clean edge, that portion is good. What I did today is I rode the whole the whole strip, and I'm noticing I ha there's, a, I'm a, there's a little bit of a challenge because I'm not out there with the DPW director, partly because we don't have one. I don't know. I could take Judy out there, I suppose, but I did talk to Paul Wade today. Um, what I think would be really useful during this period is to go out there with the plans, and it'd be really nice to go out there with Coastlin and to see what the width is, because the areas that I have of concern, I don't know where they are in the bike lane. I don't know how much they're going to narrow the lane, if it's off to the edge or if it's right in the middle of the bike lane. A couple of areas of concern. Uh, at the end of the Gelati paving area, right as you're, as you're going eastbound toward Fairfax from uh, Whites Hill, the gelati portion ends and then there's like a dip and some dirt in there like there like it doesn't it's not a continuous clean uh, continuum there basically so that's one area of concern i'm a little curious what's going to happen by christine dillon's building there right before it's azalea that goes down i believe it's pretty narrow there but i guess the striping plan has accommodated that i'm not sure about that but more importantly in terms of paving condition uh, actually that area there if it needs to be widened uh, is an area of concern the other area of concern is as you get by just about the front door of Fairfax Market there, uh, the, there's a drop off on one side. Uh, the pavement is, there's a, a, a lateral, a, 
longitudinal crack. It's very small, but it, it, it will be right in the tra uh, path of travel for bikes there. So I, I'd like someone to like walk the whole thing and make sure that the pavement conditions are good there. This, uh, just a little bit of background for those of you that don't know, this is a $100,000 project, non-motorized transportation pilot program funds, which I think came something like five years ago. And um, this has been delayed over and over again. It's really uh, critical that it gets done right and that should be a really, really clean facility when it's done. I don't know how much of the money has been eaten up in design and, and through time, but um, it's really critical that we get a really good facility in there because $100,000 is a lot for uh, two-thirds of a mile or whatever that is there. Did you go through the route before when it was originally put out? You know, the bid I, I, did, I My understanding, I have not gone out in the field, but um, because of these new issues, see, I okay. thought when I went out before, uh, I was, I I was the paving wasn't completed yet. Okay. So uh, now that I'm hearing that the paving is completed, I'm thinking uh, this needs to, someone needs to go out there and really uh, field proof it and to make sure that, that it's. I'd be happy to do a field visit with you, and I think it'd be I really think great be if good there's if you and you and Paul. Uh, Paul Wade and I went out to look. Yeah, at I would it. like so Paul to be there because yeah. I, it's difficult. The center line, I think, has moved in some places. It's pretty difficult to know where the striping is without actually dragging a tape measure along the strand. I think if the three of us and Larry wanted to join us, that'd be fine. Yeah. But I think maybe the three of us should. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, great. So thank you very much. Yeah. Can I make a comment? I just want to do it once. <laughs> And I just want to do it right. So it, whatever it takes to do that, that's where I think we should go. Yeah, yeah, it's very important to get, I mean, there's a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross and all this, and you know, it's mind boggling, but it's really crucial to have invo involvement by people in the community and people who are using these, and feedback is a good thing, especially before the thing is done. Um, Likewise, as Larry mentioned on the on this east-west corridor along Park here, I mean there are some. We were talking about maybe doing paint instead of the medallions in some place that was really right adjacent to something that needed road patching. But if there is any way to get, you know, squeeze some dollars from somewhere to to patch some get potholes there because there are some bad spots along the route. Great. Terrific. Well, okay. So um, I guess, is there any other public comments on this item? Hearing none, I will close public comment. Thanks so for that, Pam. I, I move approval of the item with the instruction to staff that we discussed. Second. Okay. There's a, a move for approval from Bragman, second uh, O'Neill. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, nobody opposed, so. Great. Um, next up is for the regular agenda. Um, we kind of had a break already. Does anybody? Let, let's just go through. Sound good? Um, okay. Next thing on the regular agenda is discussion and consideration of a petition received requesting that the town adopt an ordinance to ban gas operated leaf blowers in the town of Fairfax. And this is presented by planning and right. thanks Jim for your report. Right, good evening again. If you recall, uh, at, in your, during your October meeting of this year, Mr. Green, who resides at the Bennett House, spoke at the public mic and delivered us a petition with a lot of signatures to outlaw leaf blowers. He was concerned with the noise of the use of leaf blowers at the Bennett House. And so we put this on the agenda, so brought it back to you tonight for discussion, um, which might include, after you hear from the public and discuss this among yourselves, directing staff to prepare a resolution for you um, so that you can direct us to take this matter to the Planning Commission and do our due diligence in exploring different ordinances and working with the Planning Commission to bring back an ordinance with their recommendation to you all. So in your packet, is a copy of that um, very lengthy um, petition to ban them and also a copy of, as an example, of the ordinance outlawing leaf blowers in the town of Ross that was provided to us. Um, it came to my attention of a little earlier this evening that I guess this actually was before the uh, council back in 
October of 2007. I, it was before I was here. Um, I don't know. I just heard about it before this meeting, so I didn't have a chance to do any research. But there you have it. Oh, and it also it came to my attention this morning um, by some our crew in Public Works that we, in fact, use gas leaf blowers for our operation also. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I've been hearing about them for years and looked up our NORS or ordinances on, uh, at request from the public, but uh, yeah, it's definitely on the um, radar of a lot of people. Uh, first, I'd like to ask if there's any questions from council. I just, I'm assuming we'll move forward with directing you to do this. I know that there's a difference between electric leaf blowers and gas leaf blowers, and I think that just, I wanna, I, I don't know exactly what that difference is. My understanding is that there are some electric ones that have a lower, they have like a low speed and a high speed, and that the low speed leaf blowers may be perfectly reasonable for our town to use, and may be perfectly reasonable for lands. Having been once a landscaping professional who never once used a leaf blower, um, I know that there are certainly there are there are different levels, um, and I and I'm assuming that you would take that into consideration. And but that it would it would be helpful, I think, to us to be educated to some degree on the different decibel levels, uh, uh, so that we're not uh, making all of the landscaping companies in our town unhappy with us. But to, I think I, I would recommend um, that the way we do this is, first of all, there's also battery-operated ones, um, which are probably even quieter. Um, this is within the purview of the first view of the Planning Commission, and I would send it to them right away. Um, I would ask them to review what seems like uh, at least a first pass-through by um, the folks in Ross, and I would recommend to the people that um, they take a look at the Ross um, code, which has under unnecessary noise, they managed to glump auto body repair, musical instruments, animals and fowl and holidays, all under, under one. Our code reads as if it was the Magna Carta next to this. Um, and I would say take it back to your, if it was the council's pleasure to take it back um, to our colleagues uh, at the Planning Commission and have them flesh out the full scope of the options that are available and come back to us with a, uh, their usual well-reasoned and, and excellently prepared uh, draft ordinance. Any other questions or comments from council? If I may. Ryan? Uh, I, I agree with what David said as far as you know, going through the right channels. There, there are, um, I do have the letter here from Mr. Sargent who's brought up some other concerns and I've, heard, I've also been talking to other neighbors about it. And I've, there's also, uh, this is a big issue in other towns, uh, small Carmel and some, some places in LA. This is, this is a big deal to some people. Like it's well, well beyond six people at nine o'clock at night on uh, you know it's it's a very big issue so i'd caution us just to make sure we're very thorough and we just kind of do it right i think the common sense will will rue the day here um and, but i have well, yeah well uh, yes well no rule the day no we'll rule the day and, and i i have a uh, elect i mean one thing we have to remember is that um it's important to be able to clear that debris because it can't on the hillsides it can cause damage if you leave those things unchecked um, they will, the water will avert through them and change the course of the path of water. And I know a lot of people on my street um, have to keep that clean in order to avoid water from eroding their property or actually flowing into their driveways. Um, and it is harder to do maybe when it's wet. I, I happen to have a, an electric one. Um, and I think with the common sense with what Ross has in here, it's, it's a lot of common sense. It says, hey, you know, in emergencies or if someone really has a problem, they can come down and talk to the public works director and get a permit. If that, and, and I think that, you know, between the normal business hours, um, and, uh, but I have a very powerful electric and I can, I can move clay with it. So I think it's just about having the right power and the right piece of equipment and, and starting from there. Yeah. And, uh, I guess the only thing I would add to that is, is I mean, it's more than noise. I mean, there's a lot of erosion. I mean, if you can move clay with your air blower, you know, it's it's pretty powerful. You know, it it itemizes. I'll I'll open it up to public comment in just one moment, and um, you know, I mean, there's more issues. There's a lot of materials that get atomized and up in the air, and I believe that that's what one of the major complaints was from the Mr. Green who was bringing the petition. Uh, was the asthma and you know lung problems that it caused you know with two-stroke engines doing it but also with all that particulate matter that was become airborne sometimes for days at a time um, 
so yeah there's a you know how you use it and what what you do you know you can have different results um so i'd like to open it now for public comment and um i see at least one member here please uh, state your name and address there we go thank you john Sargent, 55 madrone road and uh, my comments will i'll give you the bottom line first and then go into it a little bit i'm very much opposed to an overall banning of, of gas leaf blowers um, and, and, I, and then I'd like to comment a, a little bit on the petition that, that you received. Um, I noticed that uh, many of the signees don't even live in Fairfax, and it's nice they have so much concern for Fairfax. I was especially noting the, the signees from Seattle, Chicago, Ohio, New York, and even Sean from Ireland doesn't want leaf blowers in Fairfax. So uh, the other thing I'd like to comment on is... Uh, his uh, petition itself. He can, he can hear him in Ireland. <laughs> is the relation to asbestos dust. And unfortunately, that's an error. Uh, what, what the petition refers to is brake dust from automobile, automobiles, and uh, manufacturers of brake products have banned asbestos for a number of years. So that, is, that should not be a concern. When you watch mechanics work on brakes, they don't wear masks because there's no, there's no asbestos there. Um, I, I also, like Ryan, usually use uh, an electric uh, leaf blower. But when we have rain, heavy rain and stuff, and I have a very efficient electric leaf blower, uh, it just doesn't cut it. If you're trying to move a whole bunch of wet leaves, the most powerful of the electric blowers really won't do you any good. It just doesn't have enough power to move wet loads. Secondly, if you, I can use an electric leaf blower the majority of the time because I have a lot of outdoor out, electrical outlets. If you don't have a lot of electrical outlets and you try to run a, a underpowered electric leaf blower with, a, for example, a 100-foot cord, you're going to run into real problems because the length of the cord will, gra will really diminish the power of that electric leaf blower. Um, I should also tell you that uh, I once had a very loud um, gas leaf blower. And um, in concern for my neighbors, I got rid of it and got a very expensive, very low noise gas leaf blower. And so I would ask you, rather than an overall ban, you may want to consider some sort of uh, a decibel limit uh, on, on leaf blowers in general. Uh, I would tell you that I think my gas leaf blower uh, may be uh, almost as quiet as an electric one, even though it costs me a lot more money. Um, I try my best not to disturb my neighbors. If somebody says, you know, my baby is sleeping at 3 o'clock on, on the afternoon, could you do it some other time? I'm more than happy to accommodate that. Um, if, if the real problem is the noise, then are we also going to ban chainsaws? Because that's what I usually hear from, from my house is chainsaws. And I can tell you, I don't mind hearing it because especially with our, our sudden oak death, it's very important that a lot of that tree work be done. However, that's the majority I hear from my residents, not leaf blowers. And I should tell you that um, I also, as a 40, over 40 year Fairfax resident, remember a time where we never used to overregulate the lives of others. And I know, I know I'm an oldster and, and maybe living in past times, but I, 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 I like the idea of neighbors being able to work with each other and show consider, consideration from each other and these kind of things rather than, uh, than uh, have uh, regulations, for example, ban something completely like that. Uh, in, my, in my neighborhood, the irritating noise is from children and babies crying and yelling. Well, I don't want to ban that. That's the normal part of growing up, you know? But, but that's the kind of noise that, that bothers me. Um, I might also suggest if you would consider not a complete ban, but maybe, for example, uh, one, the noise limit, and two, you, may, you might want to consider 
having just electric leaf blowers in the downtown commercial area because there's many outlets there and I think, and I think, uh, I think that could make sense. Um, thank you for considering my comments. Mark. Uh, Mark Bell, 60 through Dominga. I think I know Sean from Ireland. He talks with an accent, right? Is that the same? I think uh, um, this is a great thing. Even my wife has shown up because she's so happy that this is on the agenda. Um, I think most of the problem with the leaf blowers come, I think the uh, legal time is 8, 8 a.m. Uh, or 9 a.m. when they can start. And invariably, right as the second hand clicks over and it becomes 8 or 9 o'clock, there they go. Uh, we have a neighbor who has uh, a gardening service who comes, and I swear that the guy, the guy who's using the leaf blower must be standing over one leaf trying to get it to move, and for some reason it won't. Uh, I think for the most part, rakes do a really good job for like 80 or 90 percent. They're kind of like the original leaf blowers, except they really don't make very much noise. Maybe if you scrape, scrape them on the concrete, you know, people kind of have their blood run, but um, I think it's a really good idea to uh, either get like a decibel ban, uh, get rid of like the commercial ones, uh, you know, in residential areas. I can understand, you know, from, from listening to Ryan and, and the gentleman before me that, you know, we don't have hills and we don't have to worry about leaves coming down and moving like giant masses of them. Maybe there's a use for them uh, for personal ones that can be used one or two times a month like have leaf blowing day, you could have like huge neighborhood parties, everybody gets out there with their leaf blower, you know, and if it's an emergency situation, you know, like people are out, you know, pulling leaves out of the, out of the gutters, uh, you know, they could, you know, have like an open day where you can go wild with your leaf blower. But uh, I think regulating it is a great idea. Thank you. Ah, uh, uh, en français? Bon, euh, alors je trouve que c'est une très bonne idée, parce que ça fait mal aux oreilles et c'est moche, c'est très désagréable, les leaf blowers, les, les souffleurs là. So anyway, should I speak so, David, are you going to translate for us? Please state your name for the record. <laughs> Subtitles. So, um, yeah, I'm really glad that, uh, um, you know, more, more people than me think that it would be a good idea to regulate the leaf blowers. They, they seem to uh, really... Um, lessen the quality of life. It's, it's pretty hard to relax and do yoga or whatever with, with the leaf blower going on. They are just really contrary to uh, enjoying the surroundings. So uh, yeah, for some, it might be a good idea to have like some, some days that are like leaf blowing days or something so that at least you'd know. Because if you know, it, it's, it makes a big difference. Like you know like Fridays or whatever day, well then, you know, you sort of expect and it's better than if it could happen just like at any time for any length of time or something, you know, because, so that might be a good good option to do that. I think that's, uh, yeah, and, and another thing, um, the, the gentleman over there was saying that, you know, you can be considerate with your neighbors. The problem is with leaf blowers is that they carry so incredibly far away, especially if you, if you go walking in the hills, you, you'd hear a leaf blower that might be going on, you know, a mile away or something, or, you know, with the, with the bowl of the, the heels, it just, they carry, like, they can do a lot of damage to, to the soundscape of the, the area, so they are, they're pretty nasty. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Au revoir. Jim, if you, having tabulated all of these excellent ideas on both sides, if you could forward these to the commission for their consideration of each and every one of them. Yeah, Ryan. Um, a, a couple of things to consider here when we do this, um, and I made a couple of notes. By the way, the sergeants are fabulous neighbors. They, they live on my block, and um, they've been there a long time, and I think that, um, John, to tell you kind of what I think about your concept, I think that you're, you're, you're very considerate. Bo both of you are, are, are like that. I, I think you're missing a, a, a couple points. Um, from a younger generation and, and those who may have kids with asthma, I don't see these, these, these leaf blowers 
as um, fair noise complaint versus health complaint. I think that the chainsaws are the perfect example that you made. Th those are more frustrating for me, A, because I'm on the tree committee and anytime anybody hears a chainsaw, I get phone calls to ask if they have permits instead of calling the town office. Um, and those carry. Uh, we do live on the mountain, and if you live on the mountain, the noise just comes right up the mountain. Um, so uh, in, in comparison, the noise levels, uh, if you're going to allow those chainsaws, you know, I don't know how you can ban it based on noise. Um, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an important factor to consider when uh, you, you use your leaf blower any time during the summer. Um, I did it once on my street after the trees pollinated, and I blew up uh, so much stuff that I, I had an asthma attack. And so it's also it's, a lot of this is a common sense issue, um, but I think it may be a, he may have touched on a good idea that instead of telling people they can't have a gas blower versus an electric blower that you stick it to a decibel level. I think that that's a very fair trade off, um, and and that's that's I think a, a better argument to go with. Um, and I and I love the idea of a, a specific time. I mean, you know, when you're when you want to wake up and have a peaceful morning, the builder can't start until 8:30 or 9 o'clock on a day. He can't just wake up at 5 o'clock and start work. So that's common sense to your neighbors. Um, but John, when you say you remember a time where you know we weren't so restricted, um, you know, that's that's true, and that's very old school way of thinking. I mean, there was times where you could smoke on an airplane too, and there's points that are and health concerns that are drummed up in more recent studies and and although I don't like people telling me when I can burn firewood or when I can't burn firewood once you get a look at the statistics and the data it's kind of hard to ignore the fact that it does have an adverse health effect on on certain people um, and to 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 Mark's concerns also about these these things um, there's really no better and efficient method to cleaning out your gutter than to get on your roof and use a leaf blower I mean you can't it's safer it's a safer way to do the work. Uh, you're on the top of the roof and there's a 40 foot drop. You, you don't get down there with your hands and try to scoop it out. You get a leaf blower, you channel it out and the project is done. So they, and, and also they're, they're, the concept of the rake is good, um, but it's not applicable to all locations and all places. So I think again, common sense will rule the day, but I think as we send this down or we get this back, we wanna make sure that we don't, we don't say no to this product based on the sound and then allow the chainsaws which are equally as loud and much more common um, and I think that this all started as I remember as the guy who when these commercial uh, people come in here and I saw the, and, and the other funny thing is they don't seem to pick up the leaves they seem to blow it to the neighbor next to them so his leaf blower can get paid to blow the leaves down the block so I don't always see these leaf blowers actually picking up stuff. I think they're just moving stuff off the guy who's paying his property. So we may want to look at the commercial aspect versus the personal property homeowner aspect. Thanks. One really quick. There's a great product called Gutter Love It, and you never have to clean your gutters again. <laughs> Safe. It's cheap. I recommend it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not paid by the company. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well, um, I, I think that one thing my colleague Ryan was talking about was courtesy for others, and I mean, you know, picking the right time to do it, and, and I think also in the, I, I know that there's a commercial outfit that a number of my neighbors hire, and, you know, they've all got leaf blowers, and they move from one place to the next, so there's like a two-hour period with these leaf blowers going, constantly blowing them from one yard to the next. Um, and uh, I think that the, just as sometimes rakes are really the right tool for the job, sometimes a leaf blower may be the right thing for the job, and sometimes a chainsaw is the right thing for the job. But um, really, uh, it, it's kind of hard in an ordinance to say, use your noggin and, you know, use the right tool for the job at the time. But um, uh, maybe that's a challenge for the Planning Commission to deal with. Uh, Oh, do you feel directed? <laughs> that you want us to prepare a draft resolution with the intention of referring this matter after you pass that resolution to the planning commission. Can't we just direct it? Got to do a resolution. There's not a resolution. That's the process. Oh, good we can't just uh, we can sign this. Off. This is 
this whole packet of material and gives them that. Change, correct? Aren't we just asking for the Planning Commission to come back with a recommendation for us? And an ordinance, a draft ordinance. Jim, you got a Jim, can you get your mic? They can't hear you on the, the big camera. It's on. I think what Jim was suggesting is is the code section that has the council initiate by passing a resolution that goes to the planning commission saying what you want in the ordinance. So what I think what Jim is saying is he'll prepare something based on this discussion, based on the comments you've made for your consideration at the next meeting. What are you bringing back in the next meeting? A resolution. See, you, you, we've just sat through a half an hour of comment. We, you gave us a, uh, a thoughtful data dump in our, uh, in our packet here. Um, good comments by the public. Why do we have to have a resolution? You now have all of that stuff. Why are we going to go to the work and you have to go to the work of drafting up a resolution that's going to encapsulate everything that was just said to the minutes clerk, said to the public, heard from, and recorded by uh, the guy over there. I, I think that the, the code. I, I'm just following what I understand is the protocol. Yeah, and I, mean, I think, David, that the code's intention is for not to leave it up to somebody's interpretation of what everybody's said for the last half an hour, is to bring it back to us, and this is our responsibility as council. David, I think what you're suggesting, and I think you could do this legally, is pass a resolution and attach this report that, that was given to the meeting tonight and refer the readers to the minutes and say, Planning Commission, go at it. You could do that, but that's not been the practice. The practice in, in this town, since I've been here six and a half years, is for the council to do uh, uh, sort of a policy analysis and suggest what it wants. And so that's what Jim is suggesting. You could do it your way. This is, I wish right. it could be the way. It should be another action pass evening. It'll be good. Sorry, it's the, yeah, government is bureaucracy. So, um, but it has a reason for being so. Um, so I guess you will come back to us next month. Okay, so thank you. Uh, item number 13 on the agenda is discussion consideration of amending the town council meeting schedule for January and July of 2013. And I believe we had some conflicts on a couple of those days, so. Yes, we set the January meeting for the 9th and I didn't realize or think about the conflict with the fire board meeting on the second Wednesday. So um, instead of going to the third Wednesday, which would kind of bump it up against the next meeting, I was suggesting that perhaps you could agree on a date in that week of the ninth, but not the Wednesday, a different day completely. And then we have the same problem in July with, um, with the schedule. So I'd like to set a meeting for January and July, um, a date that would work for you with your schedules and the meetings that you have. So um, I suggested January, Monday or Tuesday or Thursday of the same week of the 9th. So Can I beg the council's indulgence for the 10th? I can't make the 7th or 8th. I was going to do the same. <laughs> the 10th. Yeah. The 10th. <laughs> okay, the 10th that works right. for two council members. Thursday the 10th, the second Thursday of the month. Okay. Does it seem yes, okay? It's good. I hope so. And how about July? Do you think it, it would work? Chief pick on the third, on the second Thursday. Second Thursday, So I have a conflict on the tenth. So there's no day that we could do it during that week. Well, it sounds like I could not go to the GPIC meeting. It meets here. We'll live without you. Do that first. 
Pick up Bruce. Yeah, it's fine with me. We could start the meeting later after the fire uh, board. I mean, we, get, we used to start our meetings at 8, and perhaps that would give uh, you enough time. No, this is going to go along with the fire board. Uh, the financials are coming in, and we're having a okay. lengthy report. Okay. So. I'm happy to have a conflict with the GPIC. If, okay. And I'll pick the, the council okay. over the GPIC. We can attempt to reschedule the GPIC. The same thing is true of July then, so I don't know if you want to worry about July later or make it the second Thursday of July. Assume that you have the same kind of commitments. Do you still have a come? Which would make it, which would make it July 11th? Or if we pick uh, July 9th, then we won't have the GPIC yeah. conflict. But the, but I thought that's, that's a that's Tuesday fine. night. July 9th would work for you. The Tuesday, July 9th. Okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. Great. Super. So, uh, is that resolved now? Then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. And um, do I uh, hear a motion for adjournment? So moved. I heard, I heard three moves in one second. <laughs> um, let's call it uh, move, wine soft, second or uh, Hartwell, and um, it's unanimous. So uh, thank you very much.